Hi everyone. In this video, we're going to expand on our earlier description of neurotransmitters. We're gonna focus a little bit on the different types of neurotransmitters, how they behave, and the receptors that they belong to. So neurotransmitters are chemicals that can directly or indirectly alter cell activities. And I just wanna take a moment and recap some of the things that we, we've really kind of covered already, but I wanna make sure that we properly associate all these things with neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters are produced by enzymes, and that usually occurs in the cell body. Um, we know that we have all of our machinery there, uh, the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, etc., to make that happen. Um, but it is important to note that sometimes we can reassemble neurotransmitters also in the synaptic knob um, for, um, if, they, if they get uh, broken down. Um, sometimes you can reuse the parts. Now, the neurotransmitters are stored in vesicles and... They are transported to the synapse, so again, assuming they're made in the cell body. So just a little bit of a review from earlier. We, um, the, when we drew the neuron, uh, to review the neuron structure, we drew some microtubules along the axon. We said that the vesicle is transported down those microtubules. The way that that happens is that there are these, um, like, uh, these motor proteins that look like feet that attach to the vesicle, and they sort of walk down those microtubules. So almost like walking a tightrope. It's important to know that this is happening on a totally different timeline than action potential. So the, the motor proteins move the vesicles down to the synapse where they wait, and if there happens to be an action potential, then they can be released into the synapse. So neurotransmitters are released in the synapse after depolarization of the synaptic knob. We know that that means we have influx of calcium and then exocytosis of those neurotransmitters. And once the neurotransmitter is, after it's bound to its receptor, it can be broken down by enzymes. It could be taken back up into the presynaptic membrane. It could be taken up by an astrocyte. It could diffuse away from the receptor. So lots of options for where it's going next. Now there's a couple of things that I wanna just introduce in terms of terminology. So generally the neurotransmitter will be excitatory or inhibitory, meaning it will allow for an influx of positive or negative uh, charged ions. So excitatory means that we have entry of positive ions and we create what's called an EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential. Um, so it's a fancy way of saying an excitatory graded potential at the postsynaptic membrane. And then inhibitory is entry of negatively charged ions, and we create an IPSP, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Again, fancy way of saying graded potential that is inhibitory. And don't forget that these can actually be summative, so we can have a combination of both excitatory and inhibitory. We can have entry of positive ions and negative ions, but if we have those negative ions entering and we're hyperpolarizing the cell, that just means we have to have that many more positive ions to overcome that hyperpolarization to actually reach the exon hillock and generate an action potential. Okay, so now let's talk mechanism. So we haven't really talked too much about mechanisms, but it's very important to understand the idea of a mechanism because that's how we're going to study all of our drugs. So if we think of a neurotransmitter that acts directly, then we say the mechanism is ionotropic. And this is what we've already described, so this is going to be a review, but just sort of appropriately uh, associating the, the right word with it. So in, in an ionotropic mechanism, the neurotransmitter binds to a receptor or an ion channel, and it affects the influx or efflux of ions. So we could see that we have our ion channel ligand gated, we see the neurotransmitter binds, and then it opens and allows for sodium to enter. So what will be coming up for us is being able to remember which neurotransmitters and which receptors are associated with which ion channels. The other mechanism that's associated with neurotransmitters is indirect, um, and we actually refer to that as metabotropic. And so I'm just going to kind of explain this, uh, and then we'll draw it. So in metabotropic mechanisms, we have a neurotransmitter that functions as what's called a first messenger. It binds to a GPCR, which is a G-protein coupled receptor, to cause a cascade of reactions and generation of a second messenger that affects a cell and metabolic activities. As an example, it could be like opening an ion channel, but from the inside of the cell instead of the outside of the cell. So I know that that really is 
all foreign, um, but let's draw a picture and, and try and make sense of it. So um, here we have, in this picture, we'll have a, um, a, a neuron, and instead of synapsing on another neuron, we're gonna show it synapsing on an effector cell, but it could easily be another neuron as well. So we have our neuron, then we have our effector cell membrane, and in the neuron, of course, we see that we have our vesicles containing our neurotransmitters. So when we say first messenger, the first messenger just means that um, it's it's we have essentially a domino effect, um, and it's the first, it's basically like the first domino that's going to fall. Um, so it's just the first thing that we need in order to interact with and have the effect we want in the next cell. Now, G proteins are a family of proteins. Um, that, that really are associated with second messenger activity. So you could just remember that G proteins are some proteins that are like in the membrane and associated with the membrane. And they're also associated with a G protein coupled receptor. And all that means is that it's a specific receptor that is found in association with a G protein at a cell membrane. So what I really want to emphasize about this arrangement is that the receptor is not associated with an ion channel. It's just associated with proteins that are embedded in the membrane. So it doesn't make sense that binding of any neurotransmitter to the G protein coupled receptor will cause an ion channel to open the way that we see in ionotropic because it's not associated with an ion channel. So G the family of G proteins, it would just be, will be the most common um, that we'll see when we talk about second messengers. So generally you can associate G proteins and second messengers together. Okay, so we have our X potential arrives at the synaptic knob. We have depolarization and exocytosis of the neurotransmitter. And then the neurotransmitter is going to bind to the receptor, to the G protein coupled receptor. And then what we get is what I say is a cascade of reactions. So really, I, I don't want to minimize what's happening in terms of those reactions is very important. It's just that it's a little bit beyond where we need to be for this particular curriculum. So I'm sort of condensing and summarizing the events that transpire after the neurotransmitter binds to the G protein coupled receptor. And um, so we're just going to sort of hit the fast forward button to what we say is generation of the second messenger. So we have this cascade of reactions and then we have basically converted or activated um, a, a particular molecule that will function as the second messenger. And some examples of second messengers include cyclic AMP. So remember the AMP is adenosine monophosphate and, um, and calcium ions. So it's not, um, it's not necessarily foreign chemicals, it's just that we're activating them by way of this process. So you wanna think of this sort of as a relay race. So um, if, if, uh, if the first messenger is um, holding the baton initially, is basically passing the baton to the second messenger, so the second messenger can now do whatever activity it's going to do. And its activity, um, these activities absolutely can vary and there's a whole bunch of them, but the example we'll use is we'll bind to an ion channel on the inside of the cell. So here we can see an ion channel and instead of the receptor being facing outside to the ECF, the receptor is facing the ICF and when the second messenger binds to it, it causes the channel to open. So what's interesting about second messenger is it's kind of a lengthy process of achieving the same thing that you would have gotten if you had um, if you had used the ionotropic mechanism. So then the question that follows is, well, why do we have both? So it's important to know that the ionotropic mechanism is very, very fast. Um, so that could arguably be the benefit of using a direct mechanism. But the metabotropic mechanism, although slower, is considered to be longer lasting. So what we'll see in terms of the neurotransmitters that we're going to describe is a variety of both. We'll see both ionotropic and metabotropic mechanisms a whole bunch. All right, so now let's talk about neurotransmitters and the receptors that they belong to. So I think we mentioned this before, but I'll just reiterate if not, or if not, then I'll mention it now. Um, so we have uh, specific neurotransmitters that bind to a specific set of receptors. They act in a certain way and they produce a specific response. So what we're going to do is just sort of highlight the different neurotransmitters that we want to be aware of and that we're going to consider an awful lot when we think of different drugs that we're going to be learning about and giving. And, um, and then we'll sort of associate them with uh, 
some characteristics about them. So the first neurotransmitter we want to consider is glutamate. So glutamate is an amino acid, um, and it actually binds to a whole bunch of receptors, but they include glutamate receptors and NMDA receptors. And the functions can actually be metabotropic and ionotropic. Um, typically, NMDA will be metabotropic, um, but uh, ionotropic could be glutamate. Glutamate could also be metabotropic, I believe. The next one is GABA. GABA stands for gamma aminobutyric acid, and it's also an amino acid, but not in the same way that we have our 20 amino acids. So I don't want to, I don't want to misrepresent it. It's not one of the 20 amino acids, but um, it has certain properties that allow it to be considered an amino acid. It's just not not the same as like for nutrition. There are two types of GABA receptors. There's GABA-A, which is ionotropic. We know that GABA-A is um, associated with chloride channels. And GABA B is metabotropic, and we uh, we won't really consider that too much in this class. Next, we have norepinephrine and epinephrine, and I put them together because the difference in their chemical structure is basically a methyl group, a carbon and three hydrogens. It's a tiny difference, um, and they bind often to the same receptors. And I mean, there are some differences in terms of um, in terms of their behavior, but they're similar enough we could group them together. These guys are classified as catecholamines and they're derived from the amino acid tyrosine. So there's like a um, there's like a series of chemical reactions that occur that start with tyrosine that end with uh, norepinephrine followed by epinephrine. So the epinephrine and norepinephrine bind to adrenergic receptors. So that's a classification of receptor and there are some different types of adrenergic receptor, so we want to pay attention to these. So we have alpha-1. Um, alpha-1 we definitely have to learn because it's found on vascular smooth muscle cells. Um, so we haven't really covered this in a lot of detail, but uh, basically you could find them in blood vessels. And then we have alpha-2, which we'll cover uh, maybe but significantly less. Beta-1, which is found in the cardiac cells of the heart and beta-2, which is found in bronchial smooth muscle cells, so the smooth muscle cells that, that surround the, the bronchial tubes, and then we have beta-3. And the adrenergic receptors are all metabotropic. Dopamine is also a catecholamine. It's actually also derived from the amino acid tyrosine, and it's part of the same series of chemical reactions. So we actually start with tyrosine, and then we make a couple things, and we make dopamine. Dopamine is converted to norepinephrine, and norepinephrine is converted to epinephrine. So they're all very, very chemically similar. Dopamine binds to dopamine receptors. We can abbreviate that DA, and we can, as an example, like we have this the subtype or the family D1, D2. They also bind to the adrenergic receptors, and they function, uh, their mechanism is metabotropic. Next, we have serotonin. So serotonin is, um, we think of this as um, sort of like, I think we associate it with mood most often, but it's a major neurotransmitter in the brain. Um, it actually is, uh, instead of catecholamine, it's an indolamine. It's a, a little different. Um, it's derived from the amino acid tryptophan instead of tyrosine. Serotonin binds to the 5-HT uh, receptor, so 5-HT1, 5-HT2, 5-HT3, etc. It also is metabotropic. Next, we have acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is actually synthesized from acetyl-CoA, which is it's an important chemical in metabolism. So we won't cover that um, for a while, but um, but eventually that you'll come to know that is something that's that's really very common. And then also this metabolite named choline. And what's interesting about uh, acetylcholine is that when it binds to its receptor, it actually is broken down by an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase, and um, the enzyme actually breaks acetylcholine down into acetyl-CoA and choline, and the choline actually is taken back up into the presynaptic membrane, and it gets recycled over and over and over again. So acetylcholine binds to cholinergic receptors, and there's two major types of cholinergic receptors that we want to be aware of. The first is nicotinic. Nicotinic uses the ionotropic mechanism, and then muscarinic uses the metabotropic mechanism. And those guys have um, subtypes too. You could have like muscarinic, like M1, M2, um, but really it's most important to differentiate nicotinic versus muscarinic in terms of their location and then what their mechanism is. Next we have histamine. Um, it's derived from the amino acid histidine. binds to H1, H2 receptors, functions as metabotropic. 
We have nitric oxide, which is a gas. There's a couple of gases, actually, that can function as neurotransmitters. Um, so it's a little different. I don't know that it's fair to say metabotropic for nitric oxide. It diffuses into cells. It doesn't bind on the outside, so it doesn't really work um, in the same way. But it does sort of work by second messenger in the sense that it promotes a series of reactions that generate a second messenger. So, um, so we still sort of work with the second messengers um, using nitric oxide. It's just a little different than the rest of the examples that we're using. The next one we want to mention is adenosine. So adenosine is a, um, n it's a naturally occurring nucleoside, and it actually binds to adenosine receptors. The subtypes are A1, A2A, A2B, and A3. And it also, it's, its mechanism is metabotropic. And then lastly, we want to consider the, um, so endorphins and cephalins, there's a, a couple of um, neurotransmitters that fall sort of into this category. They are peptides, meaning that they're small chains of amino acids. They actually bind to opioid receptors. And there are three classifications of opioid receptors, delta, kappa, and mu. And, um, and so this is actually, um, they function, they're, they're metabotropic as well. And this is actually um, where we're going to find that our other um, opioids bind things like morphine, codeine, um, that sort of thing. All right, so that's a really long list. It's not comprehensive. There are other neurotransmitters, and these neurotransmitters can bind to other receptors. But I think this is a good starting point in terms of things that we're going to want to pay attention to as we learn the different drugs, like I mentioned. So I wouldn't focus on memorizing them all right off the bat, but as we bring them up in the different segments and we mention them in the context of a particular neuron or set of neurons uses these neurotransmitters or as we talk about certain drugs that use these neurotransmitters, it would be really important to start committing them to memory because this is, it will help to um, make sense of and, and allow for integration of things like the nervous system with the other body systems and how it all sort of comes together. All right, so that is all for now. And um, at this point, we're about ready to move on to seeing the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system from a bigger picture. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.